Welcome everyone to the Stoic Salon podcast where we talk about life, love, work, play, the universe and Stoicism. Today, I'm going to be talking with Sharon LaBelle, who has been a key figure in Stoicism, having 25 years ago written a interpretation of slash translation interpretation of Epictetus's uh, work. And um, that is now an international bestseller. It has impacted and transformed and reignited and reimagined the lives of, I don't know how many millions of people probably, but um, it's the art of living the classical manual on virtue, happiness and effectiveness. It, um, it essentially inspired the modern Stoicism movement, and that was way back in 1993, 94. It's still a classic, and um, I'm really excited to be speaking with Sharon LaBelle. She's going to be appearing, rather, <laughs> not just appearing, she's going to be the keynote speaker um, at the inaugural, the historic, the first ever women's conference on stoicism. Of course, when I say women's, I just mean that women are kind of mostly behind the scenes and on the stage organizing and speaking. But of course, the conference is open to everyone. This is just a little way of maybe shifting the conversation a little bit and amplifying and celebrating women's voices in a largely male dominated or uh, philosophy and way of life and community in modern stoicism. So I'm really excited that Sharon is going to be our keynote. And on that note, I'm going to talk to her about all sorts of things. Buddhism, being a musician, creativity. I'm, I'm fascinated by what Stoicism can say and do for creative types um, and just creative living in general. Um, at the conference, she's going to talk about living as if your life depended on it, like choosing a philosophical life. She makes it sound very urgent and um, it'll be quite interesting to hear what, what she'll talk about there. On that note, I'm going to introduce Sharon LaBelle. And so welcome to the Stoic Salon podcast where I'm going to talk about all sorts of things, life, love, work, play, the universe and stoicism with one of my favorite people in the world who I get to meet really for the first time in this Zoom room and on this podcast, but I don't know, we've met before, the wonderful Sharon Lavelle. Oh my God. Hello and welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Okay. Excuse my girlishness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'm thrilled. Yeah. To be here. This is very special. We've had a date with destiny for a good while, I think. Yeah, we have. <laughs> we have. So I don't know who's going to listen to this. So whoever happens to be listening to this, welcome to something that we've both been looking forward to for a while. And uh, look, I'm really interested in um, just talking about personal, a, per, a kind of a personal story around stoicism, really interested in life before stoicism, and then that, that point at which stoicism happened, and then what happened, and then life after stoicism. So I'm really interested in that pivotal point. Uh, probably we'll start there. And also in general, I was going to call the podcast From Flow to Flourish. So I'm really curious about that stoic concept of flow, of living in accordance with uh, nature, which for maybe some of us is just a really weird thing because 
I certainly was brought up thinking that life wasn't supposed to be flow flowing um that struggle was part of it um and so I'd love to talk about that and how it leads to flourishing so and I get that from you this kind of joyful celebratory um result stoic kind of approach to life and I've already started babbling so how about I just ask you if you want what was the before before stoicism if you want to go there <laughs> or, or just take me wherever you want to go and we'll get there sure well this is I don't know what I'm going to say let's see what happens uh, well uh, I was I was always interested in what some people call the big questions. Um, I, I mean, I guess I, I was always amazed, even as a child, that people would be going about their workaday business and taking whatever their uh, current endeavors were very seriously, but that there wasn't this kind of regular stopping and saying, but we're alive. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I mean, look, look, <laughs> yeah. I mean, wow, <laughs> wow. And, and if you look up in the sky, it's so big and there's planets and can you believe this? And yet you're just standing behind someone in the grocery store or something and, you know, and everybody's worried about whatever they're worried about. So I've always just been kind of amazed by life itself. But parallel to that, um, I've always been acutely aware that uh, being a human being is really hard, regardless of your circumstances. It's really hard. And so I guess in some ways, I've always wanted to reconcile the wow-ness, uh, that kind of basis of awe that seems to me sort of the only legitimate, ultimately legitimate posture to have in any given moment with the more proximate demands mm -hmm. that are put on our minds and our hearts and, and animate uh, all of our endeavors and aspirations. So, okay, so let's kind of fast forward to Stoicism. So um, I came of age in the 70s and California, everybody was trying everything. Mm -hmm. And so I tried everything. And I lived for a while, actually, I went to um, Colorado, the state of Colorado, and went to a, a Buddhism, uh, a Buddhist uh, college that had just started. And I for many years, I practiced uh, Zen and some Tibetan Buddhism, which I guess gave me, you know, sort of a sense of the, the fruits of a contemplative life. But I, after a while, I didn't want to sit on my tush all the time. It was, first of all, it was getting to be the size of the state of Nebraska. <laughs> and, you 
know, I had some vanity. <laughs> you know, what am I doing? Just sitting here all day. <laughs> you know, that's too great a cause for enlightenment. That's hilarious. <laughs> so anyway, so that figured into my thoughts. Anyway, I've I've always I've always read in philosophy. I I got a degree in philosophy. But I've mostly all my life been hung up on the idea of virtue, the value of virtue. And when I encountered Stoicism through Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus, I guess those were my introductions. Yeah. Um, suddenly it, there was this um, congenial language for talking about virtue in a non-sectarian way and in an unsanctimonious way. And that was very attractive. Um, and so that, but, but my encounter with stoicism, I guess, happened, it was when I was a young mother, way back in the, I guess it was the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. Who put, <laughs> who put Marcus Aurelius or Epictetus in your hands? Or who, who told you about it? Or I know Twitter wasn't around, but you know, who, how did you find out about these guys? Dudes? Well, one thing was I, I grew up in a pretty, um, it didn't seem like it at the time, but I think it was a kind of bohemian mm -hmm. home where pretty much our furniture was books. <laughs> and, so you, it, and in fact, my father used to give speeches that, um, he, we didn't give a lot of presents in our house, um, but he said, any book you ever want, I'll buy for you. And he would get on his soapbox and say, be it pornography, be it, you know, he would just name all these uh, kind of, you know, things yeah. that would naturally <laughs> repel us. Just, if you want a book, you can have a book. So I think I just grab, grab the books and yeah. started started reading. Oh, but I know who actually I know who lit the match. You're you're actually you're um, tickling my memory. Uh, I lived across the street from a man from India mm -hmm. uh, named Narayan Champawat, <laughs> and he 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 gave me my first book uh, about philosophy and it was I I think it was probably maybe even like a, a freshman college yeah. textbook I don't know but I remember immediately cottoning to the stoics and oh. and and just I mean maybe it's because I'm more or I felt like I more readily understood mm -hmm. them than, than other philosophies. But I don't remember a certain moment where, mm. and mm. then someone gave me a gift of Mark, you know, <laughs> meditations or something. I'm, I'm trying to write the movie script, you know. So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> what's that moment? Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting that the Stoics were in that, like if it was a freshman philosophy book, that's interesting that the Stoics were in there because at when I did philosophy at university, you didn't, the Stoics weren't, you didn't learn about the Stoics on campus, right? You just did, you know, you did the pre-Socratics, you did, you did Plato, you did Aristotle, and then it's like zoom ahead to Hume and Locke and I don't know who. So all the in between was like, nah, not here, mate. And so it was, we had to go down the road to the Greek tavern where we'd get together and have our little symposia. And then you'd, I'd, I'd heard a bit about Zeno maybe, um, and then someone just recently called Socrates a proto-Stoic, which I kind of like. Um, but, yeah, didn't get to, to learn about the Stoics in a, a textbook, so that's interesting. 
Yeah. Well, now you've got me very curious <laughs> about you. <laughs> Is, will you balance the scales and just tell me? How me, me and the Stoics? If yeah. You yeah, yeah. Um, so, so undergraduate philosophy, it was all like the serious philosophers, okay? Really liked, um, I liked Nietzsche a lot and then Wittgenstein, et cetera. So didn't get to learn about the Stoics there. And I was never really drawn to any kind of, I thought when I, when I heard a bit about the Stoics off campus, I kind of thought they were a bit boring. And um, because, you know, I'm literature, philosophy, drama, and I thought that life had to be full of high tragedy, you see. <laughs> and so it was like, no, what? And, and then read a bit and wasn't really drawn to the writing itself. Had I, I only read Marcus Aurelius and Seneca in the last few years. So really basing this on a bit of Zeno maybe um, and Epictetus, um, which I didn't find attractive at all. I thought the because there was no beauty in poetry in the writing for me back in the day. Right. Um, right. And then what's interesting is I actually lived in Breveza in like years later. I travelled, um, I, I, I bought a one-way ticket to Greece. So I've got a Greek background but born and raised in Australia. One-way ticket to Greece, I was about maybe 26 or 27 and spent some time in Athens, then ended up in on the west coast in Breveza, which is like literally I was like 10 minutes away from Nicopolis, which was where Epictetus set up his school, of course. So... I was there, like, you know, where Epictetus was, which was really groovy and sort of gave him another try. But that's when, um, so your book had come out and then Tom Wolfe's book, A Man in Full, came out. Oh, yeah. So I read those books in Preveza near <laughs> Epictetus. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? So, but I still thought, mm, yeah, I don't know, okay. But it wasn't until recently when I, you know, I think it just, oh, I just went through a really dark phase of anxiety and um, all that sort of stuff. And then I, I, I developed this crazy fear of death. And so the Google algorithms then took me straight to Donald Robertson's little mini course on, on death contemplation. <laughs> so, so I got to Donald, thank goodness, via Google, and then did Stoic Week, maybe, I think it was 20. 17 or 2018 and, and from there really um, sort of started appreciating the Stokes. And I just wonder, but you see, you had an attraction very early and I've met a few people who said that they had this um, natural sense of being a Stoic even as a kid. And I think Bill Irvin calls it, calls himself a congenital Stoic, like he just had this real natural affinity to being a Stoic. For me, it's, it hasn't really been that much of a... Um, love at first sight relationship but so you were drawn a, as a as at a young age I have this theory which is probably not even my theory but I've read it somewhere that stoicism or at least that sort of wisdom comes later on in life like is stoicism easier later on in life because the wisdom DNA kicks in or something I don't know do you have a comment on age and stoicism like That's very interesting. I've never thought of that before. Because I'm certainly, I'm saying this, I'm 50 now, and it's just like it, it feels right. Whereas, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I was like not in any way even interested in, in, in trying it out or, you know, you know, so I'm just wondering whether, yeah. What you think? Way uh, off tangent, but yeah, this is interesting. No, no, I, this is a fascinating idea. Well, so Catherine, you said we were we were going to rip. So yes. first thought, best thought. I think there's something to that. Uh, um, what I'm put in mind of is one of, there are many things that are attractive to me about Stoic thought and Stoic practice. 
but one of the things I like the best, and I'm not sure I've ever even made this explicit to myself, uh, is that th there's an inbuilt imperative to ultimately trust, trust yourself as the ultimate arbiter of, mm. of value, of, of goodness. I mean, it's not that you're not listening to other people, but you're not placing, or at least this is how I see it, even though there are these canonical texts, you know, mm. written by those ancient fellows, there, there's no personality cult around them. Um, there's no, you know, quoting chapter and verse of this mm. one or that one. And I think as mm. we age, I, I hesitate to make, you know, universal pronouncements, but there's a lot of disenchantment that goes with mm. age because mm. we, when we're younger, we have heroes who inspire us, but then we pull back the curtain or the curtain gets pulled back for us. And we find out at best they're all too human or, or they're icky, you know, <laughs> they're just icky. And so over and over again, a lot of times, you know, say we'll put our, our faith in, in a body of thought, in a, in a, in a person, in a movement, what have you. And, you know, maybe, maybe we don't get burned by it, but, but we just start to see how much everyone doesn't know anything. <laughs> You know, I, I mean, we know a little bit about something, but not a whole lot, really. Mm -hmm. And so I think as we age, we start to see that it's not that we know any more than anyone else, mm -hmm. but, but I think we become less naive about mm -hmm. uh, just placing our bets on on a certain path or on a certain I, I mean this this is paradoxical because on the one hand you know the the foundation of this talk is that we like stoicism we get mm. value from stoicism mm. but somehow stoicism seems to me uh uh, it offers the opportunity to, for the, for its ideas to be protean, for them to grow, for them mm. to evolve, because ultimately mm. you have to ask yourself, what is good? What is worthy? Mm. And then pivot accordingly in that mm. direction. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I love that you've, that's really interesting you saying that you have to ask yourself. Yeah, because although there are these texts and certain teachings, ultimately you are left to ask yourself because it depends on your your role in life. Your, who are you? Are you a mother? Then, okay, well, what, what do I have to do now as a mother sort of thing? So, yeah, it's really, yeah. And you're saying that and I was thinking, I think, the idea of taking responsibility, which, yes, which is a really, it's a weird concept as well. Like, ah, oh, taking responsibility literally, like, so based on the idea of what's in your control, what depends on me, what doesn't depend on me. But that really means that ultimately, I have to take responsibility for even making that choice. That. I, you right. know, even that choice, like my, it's my responsibility to say, oh, okay, actually, yeah, I, I, I can only control this or the, this is, this is what depends on me. Um, so that's really interesting. Just that, that initial choice to, yeah, to ask yourself the questions 
and to take that response. Yeah. So stoicism is kind of not like, da-da. It really is so subtle in these little tiny mind shifts that, yeah. Mm. I think it places the demand on us. Mm. Um, Mm. And I I like to think that goes with mature, uh, gradual maturity that we're willing (laughs) to take up that yeah that mantle Mm. because also we realize you know no one else is ultimately going to take care of us yes we've got to figure it out whatever the it is in our current yeah 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 Yeah. definitely which reminds me now i was on um uh your website and i saw that let me just bring it up in the background here that store Stoic time. And off I went to stoic time and I sort of procrastinated there for a bit. And um, you had the one of the T-shirts and the quote was, if you wish to be loved, love. Which, uh, again, it's that's really powerful, isn't it? Um, I want to talk to you about love. And what do I want to ask you about love? Jump in at any point. (laughs) I don't really know. Um, So how do we love, how are we brought up to love? I mean, I know everyone's been brought up differently and has learned, watched different movies, I guess, and read different books. Um, But um, this idea of if you want to be loved, love, hmm. Why is that one of your quotes on those T-shirts? Why did you pick that one out? I think it's because going back to the ABCs of Stoicism, there's the pile of things you can control and the pile of things you can't control. Mm. And one of the ways we get our knickers in a twist in our life is we we just want people to love us. We want them to approve of us. We want them to get us, you know, to kind of receive us on Mm. our own terms. Mm. Um, And uh, people don't comply, Uh, you know, not because (laughs) they're, I mean, they're just busy trying to be loved and to be properly received themselves, right? So within that schema of what can we control and what we can't, if you just love and you say, well, how do you just love? you know, I don't, I don't think that there's like a, a love protocol that you can spell out, but I think you can be willing to love or fake it till you make it or, or just give and, and let lots of giving then tease you into, you know, you wake up one day and you realize you've been loving all along. Yeah. And of course, you know, you get that, uh, what do you call those feedback loops? Mm -hmm. You know, when you, when you start acting loving, not in a contrived way Mm -hmm. and not with a, I shall exhibit love in order to (laughs) get this particular outcome from person X, Y, Z, but there's, I don't know, there's something about just opening one's heart and, you know, doing that as a kind of thought experiment even mm. and see what what happens. Mm. I've, I've found it to be miraculous. Mm-hmm. Not because you end up, aha, I tricked them into returning, yeah. but you, you realize that just having an open heart and at least being willing to love whatever that means 
or allowing love in. I, I don't even know the vocabulary for it, but suddenly the world becomes a friendly place. Mm. And there, and there's, you can feel at home in the world. Mm. You almost need like an invitation to know that that's the way to do love or one way of doing love. Like you just don't know. I don't think for many years growing up, you think that you just need to sit pretty and look pretty and be smart and I don't know, have money or whatever it is. You've got to be all these things and then it's just going to arrive at you. You'll be chosen and loved. Um, yeah. You don't get taught that, hey, just, well, I don't know if you do or don't, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I feel that uh, you kind of get, you, you kind of learn that you have to groom yourself in some way in order to receive this love thing. And if you don't receive love, you you tend to feel that, oh, I haven't groomed myself well enough to, or nice enough or pretty enough. So having that, that's a real mind shift then to like think, okay, well, why don't I just love? And then bring it in. Mm. Well, especially because it seems... Well, it seems to me that you've just described the quintessential female burden mm. of, of it, mm. it, I, I mean, I think that's, that's especially an, an mm. onus for females mm. that we mm. feel we have to be worthy mm. um, and that there's certain things we have to do or refrain from doing mm. in order uh, to matter mm. Mm. and I'm glad you brought up the gender issue because of course we're um it's only a couple of months away or six weeks away the first women's conference on stoicism and uh it's quite interesting Sharon some of the feedback we've had on the the program as it's kind of formed and built and we put it out there the I don't know if you've seen the final program, but we've basically zoomed in on three sub themes. And one is uh, creativity and mindfulness and care, care for the self, care for the community, family, etc. And uh, there was quite an interesting response to those themes and just the way the program kind of fell into place. I mean, Brittany and I had an idea about what we wanted to put out there sort of practical, joyful, celebratory stoicism. And we got this back. Um, so sessions on mindfulness, um, creativity, etc., care, compassion, compassionate self-care. And some of the responses were, well, I don't want it from women was, I don't want to be a part of that conference, <laughs> you know, like, care? Right? yeah, care, marriage. That's irrelevant. You know, <laughs> what about, what about, I don't know how to, had a lead in a corporate world or something like that. So that was quite interesting. And then you made a comment and I've just copied it in the background somewhere. You said something, can't remember where you did this though. Um, you talk about the feminine and the female experience and you say, I see modern Stoics embracing the wisdom that is especially endemic to the female experience. The realization that life is so much bigger and incomprehensible than us and our puny dramas that we can't will circumstance to our preferences or tastes that we have responsibilities to others that we through our choices and consequent actions are the matrix of civilization. And it was quite interesting because I saw your quote after already the speakers coming in with, you know, proposals to talk about care and compassion and, um, you know, uh, mindfulness. And I thought, yeah, that idea of, so the essential, the concept of, hey, it's not, you know, get out of yourself, put yourself out of yourself and just see yourself, you know, in the bigger picture. You suggest that that's, a, that's endemic to the female experience because we've always suggesting we've always been carers or, you know. Um, so, yeah, anyway, I just wanted to maybe talk a little bit about women um, and whether that, certainly for me, the, the way the conference program has, has come about is really starting a different conversation, a parallel conversation to some of the conversations we've been having 
um, in the Stoic community. And of course, I'm very new to the Stoic community, so don't quote me on all that. But yeah, um, do you want to elaborate on that quote that I read, your quote, and then see what happens? Gosh, I, I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> yeah. Um, That's okay. <laughs> uh, can, Probably because I'm babbling. No. Oh, oh no, please, please don't say that. <laughs> you're, you're saying good things, mm. saying very good things. I, um, I mean, I have pat answers I could give to that. I don't want to give pat answers to things anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe I'm moving towards an, an an a real answer by just confessing that. I don't know if I'm directly speaking to that quotation or not. But I know that it's part of my experience being a female and I don't speak for all females or all people, but I, I've had to, because I am a female deal constantly with the unrefined parts of life. And there is, there is a kind of ethos that adheres to stoicism as maybe it's understood in the mainstream that we want to refine ourselves we want to be, of course, everyone's very quick to say, it's not that Stoics don't have feelings or anything. You know, there's always that disclaimer, but there is still this, for lack of a better word, a, a, a kind of nimbus, a, a, a cloud of, we should have self-control. Mm. We, we shouldn't, be, I, I mean, I'm saying this out loud for the first time, and it's not like anyone's standing there saying, this is the correct way to be a star, and this is, where, but I think there is a kind of tacitly held idea mm. of this kind of elegant self-possession mm. where, you know, you're not losing your shit mm. all the time. Mm. And the thing is, as, as a female, it's not because of that old thing of, oh, we're so emotional, we can't, do it's not that, but it's like, you know, you go back to being, uh, you know, 13 years old and you have to worry about your menstrual pad, you know, mm -hmm. you know, oh God, she's talking about that. But females have to think about taking care of the messy things and making sure that everything still is copacetic. And then, you know, we got to worry about not getting pregnant and we've got to, um, and, and I mean, these aren't our major preoccupying thoughts because we are first and foremost people, mm -hmm. but, There, uh, we have to be so much more careful mm. in, in the world, mm. um, not least because of always the threat of male violence, whether mm. it's actually enacted or not. And that's emotional. That mm. is, mm. Um, you can't just be kind of rigidly strategic about mm. being a female in the world. Mm. And then say if you have, you know, I, I had a whole brood of children and you got to wipe their tushes every day and they're spitting up all over the place. And then they become teenagers and they're just 
total jerks, but you love them. And it's, you can't just, you know, put these things on a, a little flow chart or, um, you know, get all your soldiers to line up in, in, in pretty uh, rows. And so, I don't know, I, I, you know, maybe I'm committing the, you know, the original feminine crime of just being mm. effusive and diffuse mm. in what I'm saying, mm. but I don't know. I, I think it's so important for females to have a voice, a loud voice within stoicism, within philosophy more general, mm. generally, and within the world because we're so in touch with the fragility of everything mm -hmm. because we're holding everything together all mm -hmm. the time. And um, I don't know, anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking, you know, on the program talking about parenting and how to care in the community, volunteer work, that sort of stuff. And I think that um, I love where this program is going. And also we're going to have the creativity discussion, which is like, for me, it's like, wow. And so the call for, well, you know, how can stoicism help me in a business meeting or how can stoicism help me in that confined, controlled space doesn't necessarily interest me at this point in time, but what you're saying and what came back from the speakers was like, yes, yes, it's different. It's a different conversation coming very organically from, from the women who have, you know, decided to join us on this first occasion. Um, hmm. And I think that, uh, yeah, I was just reminded of, um, you know, Seneca, I mean, I haven't, I'm still getting through Graver's translations of Seneca's letters, but to Lucilius. Um, but uh, I kind of like, okay, so I'm a real newbie to Seneca. I don't really know. I haven't read enough, but I really like how, like there's this one letter. I, I, I keep thinking it's letter number 12, but it probably isn't. And what he talks is he gets angry. So he goes and visits his childhood home, I think. And he's writing to Lucilius saying, got there. It was a wreck. It was demolished. It was ridiculous. So I got angry. I get angry at the caretaker, get angry at the doorman, get angry at everyone. Lucilius, I took full advantage of my emotions and just got totally angry at everyone. And he does that in paragraph one. And then the next paragraph, he sort of takes, you can almost feel like he's taking a bit of a step back and thinking, all right, hold on. I got angry, but actually I didn't really get angry at the house being old. But the fact that the house is old and that I was young when the house was young means that I'm now old. So I'm actually getting angry at the fact that I'm getting old. So he's taking a step back and then the rest of the letter, in the rest of the letter, he proceeds to, you know, compose a philosophical essay on the virtue of getting old, right? And I'm thinking, I don't know, a lot of the people that I've spoken to think that Seneca's totally staged and he didn't really get angry because he's a sage. So it's like, you know, but... I, I can imagine like Seneca getting really pissed off at this guy and just like, you know, and then just laughing at himself thinking, Oh my God, I got so angry. Um, but uh, yeah. So I think this, so you said how difficult life is. And then I think what stoicism has taught me is that you just have to keep, just keep starting again every day, work in progress. And I think Seneca's a work. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Every moment can be a pivot point. Every, yeah. Every day can be that that mm. day. That you, yeah. But it's me. almost like it's not like you learn it and then you're done. You have to keep going back. Like I I live next to a little mini cemetery. And um, so you'd think, you know, memento mori would be like poo in my face, right? But every, I just forget. I just forget to even look at the cemetery and give myself like, I, I, I tend to have a daily little death ritual where I just kind of just have that brief like thought, maybe stroll through the cemetery with Henry. But if I don't do that on any given day, I'm just like, forget, forget that I'm going to 
die. <laughs> it's just like life's the big drama, yeah. So this constant, um, constant requirement, like I think on my app probably need a, you know, well, that's why we have apps now to remind us to do a little stoic meditation. But um, what is it about that? Why do we forget to just, why don't we just learn it? I don't know why I'm asking you why, but anyway. I, no, but it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. Because we drift and we return. We drift yeah. and return. Can I ask you? Yeah. What do you think stoicism is for? Mm. For you? Um, I think for me, it's, I think for me, it's learning how to pay attention to what it is that I should be doing now, what it is I should be thinking, what, what's really going on here. Um, so I think paying attention, um, yeah, if I, if I were to just, yeah, I think that, uh, I, cause I think that when I, when I was going through my like really crazy fear of dying, which was, I realized it was probably just a result of, you know, just anxiety and maybe a bit of depression or something like that. Um, yeah, that catastrophic you know, catastrophic thinking that can take you on these tangents that last, like, you know, I had to stop myself from like journaling <laughs> in my notebook because I could just ruminate for pages and pages and pages, you know. So um, I kind of worked on little stoic um, meditation in writing practice and I've actually run workshops on that now and it's, it's, it's really interesting. So I've, um, uh, so one kind of thing that I worked on to, to help me with the, fear of death and just general anxiety was to really work on kind of a stoic way of meditating on paper in writing, which um, took the form of just like not thinking, but just copying the works of say Marcus Aurelius. So literally just copying yes. so that I remove, you know, <laughs> the, um, the desire to interject or to claim an opinion. Um, so copying, which um, is very mindful, again, um, makes you pay attention to what's been said. Listening, I think, yeah, we don't listen so much. Uh, and so, yeah, listening. Uh, yeah, and then just rewriting the texts as um, as Marcus Aurelius really did in, in the meditations, right? He basically just rewrote Epictetus, the, the teachings. Um, yes. Yeah. So I don't know if I answered your question. What do I think is, okay. So that's my quick answer. What do you think stoicism is for then? For me, it's, It's a way to see and hear the meaning in this moment. Mm. It's an injunction to make meaning. And somehow, It's been a way to be accessible to the meaning, to life's meaning that, that finds us inexplicably, that, you know, just taps you on the back. <gasps> Look. Mm. Mm. Because to me, the fundamental problem of being a human being is that there is no evident or scientifically defensible meaning for our lives. Mm. I mean, you know, mm. it, if you want to be really cynical or vulgar, mm. you know, we're just kind of bags of meat, you know, <laughs> reproduce, eating, reproducing, growing, dying, eating, mm. you know, 
But I find in Stoicism uh, that in the effort to ennoble myself, life in turn starts To, re to, re to reveal a, an, an absolute intrinsic meaning. Mm. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's my shot at that, but mm. yeah. I'm kind of a meaningfulness maniac. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I love and, that. And, and you know, so, yeah, I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead. Well, I, was I just have a habit say, of jumping. No, no, me too. <laughs> You're my friend. Um, we can both overlap each other. Um, it, it, no, enough said. Enough said. Over to you, Catherine. I was just going to say that I, when I did, I started philosophy. So after high school, uh, my English teacher, she had a friend who had started first year philosophy at the University of Sydney. I, I grew up in Sydney. And, uh, and so I'm like, oh, philosophy, what did your friend think? And my teacher said to me, she spent that her friend studied philosophy. And I think it was metaphysics and epistemology, the, the two subjects that you do in the first year, in the first semester. And so she spent the whole week at the steps of Wallace Theatre, which is like the big philosophy hall. Wallace Theatre just crying on the steps of Wallace Theatre after philosophy class. And I was like, ooh, I want to go and learn something that's going to make me cry. So I enrolled in philosophy. Yes. Right? Right? Yes. That's it. That's <laughs> it. It's that's I mean, it. You know, even like I, I fell in love with Stoicism via Marcus Aurelius. Um, and not just Marcus Aurelius, really, I have to thank um, Pierre Hadot because he really helped me see the beauty in the writing. And then also in Gregory Hayes' translation, in the introduction, he writes a bit about the literary style of Marcus Aurelius. And Gregory Hayes says that, so the whole idea that Marcus Aurelius doesn't do any original philosophy in the work, what he does is re-express and, and just rewrite and reformulate the Stoic teachings. And, oh, this is going to take us to the creativity discussion finally. But um, I was thinking, so Marcus Aurelius is literally just copying this text, right, which is like, where's the genius in that, says capital R Romantic Catherine, right? But then what he does in the way he reformulates it, because he's rewriting it as per Hado's interpretation, he's rewriting it to make every sentence and every word so striking that it can just imprint on his psyche, right? So he can remember it because it's all about memorization. So he can take it with him to wherever he's going and just deal with the world. And then what he produces from essentially copying and then, you know, imitating, rewriting, etc. He produces this creative masterpiece, which, speaking of crying, I, I, I'm very moved by, by a lot of the Marcus Aurelius. It's stunning. It's stunning. It's, it's stunning. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. So, so, you know how initially I was like, oh, you know, the Stokes are so boring, there's no poetry, there's no lyricism in their work. Well, well Marcus Aurelius brought that. And I think because he was so private in what he was writing. It was, yeah, it was just so just him alone. I think that allowed him to really get to the source of what he wanted to write. Whereas Epictetus was always kind of telling people that's different yes. that's a different conversation Marcus Aurelius was just it was just him trying to dig deep find find the source somehow and I'm just yeah I think that's remarkable beautiful text so that's my take on Marcus Aurelius so yeah I kind of a bit of a fangirl Marcus Aurelius <laughs> <laughs> I actually um sort of 
just part of part of these like journaling challenges that I do with my group. Oh, you might have seen some of them. So we basically just, you know, rewrite and then copy and then like bullet point and then re, re, reframe and everything. And some really beautiful stuff comes from everyone doing that. I mean, I've, we've been, we even have had some artists in the group and they've kind of done word art and like around the Marcus Aurelius like text. And it's just like, whoa, everyone's trying to recreate it in a way that will just strike their psyche, as Hado says, to have this like, bang transformation to pull yourself out of yourself and pull yourself um, out of yourself yeah yes 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 yeah excuse me <laughs> but yes yes <laughs> bold face italicized <laughs> exclamation <laughs> exclamation point Duh -duh. and then yeah. emojis we can yeah. add emojis now okay i'm going to lead us into um I really want to talk a little bit about creativity because, uh, yeah. you know, initially for me, the idea that stoicism could somehow um, assist or be interesting for someone who's creating was, you know, a bit of a disconnect. But, um, uh, yeah, what I said about Marcus Aurelius, the idea of um, something so gorgeously original and unique and mark and just, you know, um, uh, so gorgeous uh, and creative came from just the process of copying suggests that uh, there's no unique genius in all of us. Um, you know, eternal recurrence, etc. We're all it's just all like, you know, there's no original idea out there, but how can you make it? your own so that sort of idea of create I mean there are so many issues when it comes to creativity the idea of being remembered so reputation um which is challenged what, again by what, what was the last thing you just said the um, idea of reputation being remembered oh, reputation. okay yeah um which is challenged I guess by stoic philosophy actually Sharon have you seen or read um Piotr's book um does happiness write blank pages so mm -hmm. Piotr Stankiewicz, um, who's mm -hmm. one of the Stoics who presented at, I think, both la last two modern Stoicism. Actually, so he's been writing on Stoicism for a while. So he wrote this book, which I don't think I've got. Oh, wait, one sec. It's, it's really academic, but it's mind-blowingly good. Um, I wrote a review on it. It's called Does oh. Happiness Write Blank Pages? And yeah. it's Piotr Stankiewicz. Um, and he presented on this um, maybe in 2019. I went to Athens. <clears throat> and he talks about, yeah, so you know the, the classic idea of the tortured artist that, you know, you need to be suffering in order to create. So he's saying, well, um, you know, a stoic who's got things under control, et cetera, et cetera, well, what, how can they be creative? And he just um, goes through um, all, all of the concepts. So he talks about fame from a stoic point of view. He talks about, um, yeah, so the afterlife, so re being remembered. Um, uh, he talks about value and meaning and just presents like a stoic approach to it. But I want to ask you, um, because you're going to be talking about um, creativity and stoicism, and you're a very, very creative person. So how do the two, yeah, just an open question there, creativity and stoicism for you. <laughs> for me, the link is duty. Okay. The idea of duty. Mm. And what do I mean by that? Mm. I mean that we, we find ourselves in our lives within a certain environment, set of circumstances. And then that's, that's our palette, right? We, we, there's, that's our palette. These are um, 
the supplies, the media that we have to, to use, to uh, ex simply express here, here I am. Not in the sense of look at me, I'm more important than anybody else. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, just like that filament of a dandelion over there and the house we're living in, we're here. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. to me, um, well, here, uh, let me demonstrate. I So w when I was, uh, I guess in my late teens, I came upon a fellow playing this bizarre instrument. I, I had never seen it before. It was shaped like a trapezoid and he was hitting it with hammers. And I heard the sound. It was the most beautiful sound I'd ever heard. And although I didn't put it in words or write out some kind of formal covenant, I knew it was my duty to liberate that sound, to somehow make that sound available to other people. And so within the circumstances that I have been thrown into, um, that, it, that instrument act, um, came to me and it thereby inspired me, excuse me, <coughs> pardon me, to learn how to play that and then over time, I just realized there's no one else around here. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a frog in my throat. <laughs> Do you wanna take um, a minute, grab a glass of water? I'll just play you some music. Yay, I thought you were gonna demonstrate something. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just, because somebody has to do this. So it's on me to do it. I love it. There. So um, I'll, first of all, I'll show you this thing. <clears throat> this is, it's, whoopsie. it's a one of a kind instrument that I had made uh, for me by this um, physicist who decided he didn't want to be in academia anymore. <clears throat> and so he just lives on a, a boat and builds one of a kind instruments to order. <laughs> oh so my goodness. He made this thing and it has 106 strings and it's five octaves. And um, I think that it just evokes a sense of um, holiness or something like that. Anyway, whoopsie, excuse me. What's it's it not, called? The thing. The thing. Yes. <laughs> 
So it's duty, right? We're given things and it's our job to liberate the beauty or the possibility or to build the bridge or to put on the paths to flourishing conference. I think it's just on us to just go all in with the media that are given to us. But by, by media, you know, I don't mean the digital world necessarily, but just mm. the the stuff. I think we're here to make stuff. Mm. To make stuff that I don't know, somehow eases or lifts the anvil off people's mm. heart. Mm. Sharon, that was so beautiful. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being you. You're so you. <laughs> your you-ness your is just fabulous. <laughs> so is yours, my darling. So is yours. I wish I'd known about that duty thing earlier, but I like, I, I'll just inherit it now. I'll take it on. I like it. Oh, it's yours. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Put your signature on it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I mean, do you, do you ever feel, I don't know, maybe it sounds too grandiose, but sort of callings or, you know, within a religious language, people would say, oh, I have a vocation, you know, or, mm. you know, sometimes just there's these, you know, this is here yeah. for you to do. I did, I did with writing for a while and then I kind of lost it and I think I'm now, I'm now starting to feel that again. I kind of lost the faith in a way. Yeah. And, uh, and didn't, like lost all faith, right? <laughs> like all the faiths, lost them. Yeah. Uh, and then even You're the writing. And then even, <laughs> but they, they don't tell you that. Okay, if you lose the faith, you have to kind of replace it with another faith. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, so I skipped that page in the textbook. But, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I've, I've been, like, doing this is slightly off topic, but actually I think there's a real connection. I've been doing a whole lot of Julia Cameron's Artist Way um, stuff with, yes. with, with writers. Um, mostly, um, but also really finding interesting parallels with stoicism in this weird way. I mean, Elizabeth Gilbert's Big Magic, um, which is a, create, a book on creativity, also has a number of mm, stoic ideas as well. So I'm, I'm kind of really, yeah, finding the faith. And I think I'll add duty to it now as well. Uh, I think I'm pretty much set to go for however many years I have left. Thank you. Thank you for giving me that last piece of the puzzle. I love it. I'll be extorting favors from you. <laughs> please do. Please do. Um, oh, well, we will meet in person soon. Yeah and uh continue this conversation Case but uh, might let you go now thank you so much for this amazing conversation oh thank you thank and you what a pleasure and privilege and a gift to me i'm so grateful and before i pull out the box of tissues <laughs> <laughs> I will hug you, a big hug, yeah, virtual hug. Yeah, I've practiced virtual hugs. Um, and uh, I will probably see you before the conference. Maybe we'll have a quick kind of check-in, see you oh. at the conference, and then, um, yeah. I had a million and one other questions, but I think uh, that was nice to spend that time together. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.
Bye for now, but love always. (laughs) (laughs) Bye. Bye Bye-bye.